You hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to thank, first of all, Ima for the invitation and for the opportunity to present our journey and experience in continuous manufacturing at Janssen. It's a great pleasure being here today, and it's always a pleasure to talk about continuous manufacturing, a technology which I truly believe is changing the future of pharmaceutical manufacturing. So what I would like to do is to guide you through our experience, our strategy and vision in continuous manufacturing in the next years to come, but also guide you through some of our uh, not only experience, but also some of the key aspects of continuous manufacturing for all of solid dosage forms, and see how continuous manufacturing is not only changing the commercial operations, but changing and revolutionizing, to some extent, the strategies we do drug product development in, in new products, so at the early stages of R&D. So what about our strategy and, and journey? Uh, well, we started our journey back in 2008, when in uh, collaboration with the CSOPs, a group of universities, which probably you have already heard of, we decided to conceptualize the idea of continuous manufacturing for oral drug products with a real industrial application. So we identified Presista, a medicine for HIV, and already on the market as a batch process, as an ideal candidate due to the relatively low complexity of the formulation and also the fairly high volume at the time. So uh, between 2010 and 2013, in collaboration with Rutgers University, we designed, uh, implemented, and qualified our first self-assembled direct compression line for continuous. At the same time, we started development for Presista, uh, starting at Rutgers University, and once the line was available in our supply chain facility, then we transferred. Um, until 2015 when uh, we filed the process, and it was an expedited approval. In fact, we filed in December 2015, and we got approval in April 2016. And this was a major milestone in the field of continuous manufacturing. In fact, it was the first time that FDA had ever approved a switch from batch to continuous manufacturing. And from here, things went really fast. In fact, in less than three years, we got approval for Presista, 600 milligrams, in 13 additional countries. We got approval by PMDA for our second legacy product that we converted from batch to continuous manufacturing, uh, Tramacet, a combination of tramadol and paracetamol, which is being um, manufactured in our supply chain side in uh, Latina, Italy. We also invested in our first R&D continuous manufacturing line as a part of a much bigger strategy, but I will get back to that in a couple of slides. But first of all, why the journey? Why did we invest so much time, resources, and effort in continuous manufacturing? Well, the answer is easy. Uh, the answer we strongly believe that continuous manufacturing has the potential of increasing flexibility, agility, and quality of pharmaceutical manufacturing. And we also believe that continuous manufacturing has the potential of modernizing, even though we are not quite there yet, as Professor Trout told about it yesterday, but has the potential of modernizing pharmaceutical manufacturing, which, especially if we look at the oral drug product, is somehow stuck to the 50s. Now, I don't want to go through all the different advantages of continuous manufacturing, which were brilliantly uh, discussed yesterday by Moher and other speakers, but I want to stress the fact, I mean, one of the biggest advantages of continuous manufacturing, at least I found personally highly fascinating, is quality. In fact, thanks to advanced control strategies, continuous manufacturing enables not only a much higher level of control, but also process understanding of what's going on in your process, which you will never reach with your conventional batch processes. And this is the reason why FDA and other regulatory agencies, they are strongly advocating a switch from batch to continuous manufacturing. Being continuous also, as it been said yesterday, a true enabler for quality by design. Now, was the journey easy? Well, definitely it was not. And especially for us, because we were one of the first players implementing continuous manufacturing. So we had to deal with a lot of new aspects, from process design, control strategies, using you know, RTD and PAT and real-time process models, to ensure material traceability in a dynamic process, and also divert real-time non-conforming material. We had to deal with automation, and more recently, with real-time release testing. 
But the key question here is not whether the journey was easy, rather if the journey was rewarding. And the question, the answer is absolutely yes. And the data for Presista, they speak by themselves. So thanks to continuous manufacturing, we were able to reduce the manufacturing cycle in time for Presista from 13 days to less than 25 hours, which also meant a reduction of around 70% in Manhauer. We reduced the footprint of more than 50%, and the data, which I found personally highly fascinating, is the reduction in release testing cycle in time from, we've seen here, more than 21 days in batch to less than one day in continuous manufacturing, thanks to real-time release testing. I will get back to that later. So after the, I would say, success of Persista, where are we now? What is the strategy and vision in the next years for us at Janssen? As Lawrence mentioned yesterday, we currently have two continuous manufacturing line in our commercial supply chains, one in Gurabo in Puerto Rico, one in Latina, Italy, where a persistent tramaset are manufactured, respectively. And these lines are also dedicated, whenever there will be the, uh, the occasion to do that, to convert potentially other legacy products. We also have invested recently in a first R&D continuous manufacturing line as part of a bigger strategy. What does it mean? It means that a few years ago, Janssen made the commitment of using continuous manufacturing as the standard platform for developing new chemical entities. So it means that the entire oral solid portfolio of Johnson & Johnson Pharma, with, of course, few exceptions where it doesn't make sense to go in continuous, but they will go in continuous manufacturing. And to enable this strategy, we also have invested in a new commercial line, which is now being installed in our supply chain in Latina, Italy, which shares the same PAT strategy um, uh, automation as the line we have in development. And the reason for this, what we address internally as a mirror strategy, so really one-to-one -one transfer, uh, is to enable one of the key advantages of continuous manufacturing, which is the speed to market. So really have a, uh, a seamless tech transfer, reducing the time needed for transfer, reducing uh, API needs and, and efforts. And also to reduce uh, the risk associated to tech transfer. If we look at you know, where most of the things go wrong during our development activities is during tech transfer, when we have to scale up or scale out to different equipment or equipment sizes. Uh, and continuous manufacturing offers an opportunity, definitely, to de-risk that aspect. I want to um, comment a bit more on this uh, tech transfer strategy. Uh, so definitely using continuous manufacturing, we are, um, let's say, not using a conventional tech transfer anymore. It's definitely more a lean approach. But we are still repeating some activities. For instance, a confirmation run to make sure that everything in commercial runs out smoothly. But we've been challenging ourselves and saying, OK, if everything, I mean, if we can guarantee during development that the process is very robust and we are transferring to an exact copy of the line, do we really need to do a conventional tech transfer or even there is any need of repeating any development activities? Or can a virtual tech transfer where we simply transfer you know, process parameters can become a new normal? And we really hope that in the near future, uh, we will be implementing this, this new strategy. Speaking of vision, uh, a bit with a longer term, I would say at least 10 years, and trying to make Lawrence dream come true, we are definitely uh, working on the concept of modularity and flexibility. So Lawrence already uh, presented brilliantly yesterday what is the idea of Janssen behind this concept. Uh, but I just want to restate the fact that we are dealing a lot with a very dynamic product portfolio and very dynamic market demands. So we do need lines which are flexible and modular. So not only in terms of throughput, but also in terms of equipment which the lines are capable of. Um, I'd like to get you through now some of the key aspects of uh, continuous manufacturing for oral solid dosage forms. And I tried to put in this slide uh, some of the key aspects or hot topics uh, that we've been dealing through kind of chronologically from the beginning till now in continuous manufacturing, going from material characterization, use of real-time process models, uh, some regulatory aspects, for instance, batch definition, but also more um, let's say, contemporary aspects like validation approaches using continuous manufacturing, and then again, real-time release testing, etc. Um, 
most of the things that have been discussed already yesterday, but I think this is the disadvantage of being a speaker in the second day, where everything has been discussed and answered the first day. Uh, but I will try and go through some of the things, giving a different aspect, at least giving an industrial perspective to it. Uh, we don't have the time to go through each uh, every aspect, but if you see anything in this slide that you find particularly interesting or you would like to discuss more into details, feel free to reach out to myself or Lawrence. We'll be happy to engage in the discussion in the next days. Um, there are a few things I would like to discuss a bit more into details. Uh, one of them is material characterization. So we hear a lot about process dynamics, uh, control strategies, but we don't talk, I think, enough about material characterization, material properties, and the impact that material properties can have in continuous manufacturing. Why I'm saying this is because if I look at my product portfolio in small molecules, the majority is class two or class four BCS compounds. So they're poorly soluble compounds. They don't need micronization, some sort of particle engineering or enabling technology, like spray drying, Holtzmatt extrusion, et cetera. So the powder I have to deal with is very cohesive, very static, very difficult to process. Well, you might say this is not a big difference compared to batch. True, but in batch, you're dealing with a final blend, which has a decent flowability. If it doesn't flow, then you don't have a process. In continuous manufacturing, your API, which is not your best friend here, has to be fed through your gravimetric feeders. And what happens in 80% of our cases, at least with our APIs, is what you see in the picture here. So it's so static that it doesn't get even through the uh, screws of our gravimetric feeders. So, Certain aspects like triple electric charging, which of course were important in batch, in continuous manufacturing they become even more important because this aspect can have an impact overall on the process dynamics. Very important then is also to understand batch to batch variability and how this can affect your uh, process, both for the API and the excipient. Now, in the interest of time, I'll only mention one example with the API. And what you're seeing here on the left side is a fit factor profile, so amount of material dispensed per screw revolution in a gravimetric feeder for three different batches of the same API. In red is the first material we processed on the line. Um, in, the, in the meantime, then our colleagues from chemistry, they upscale the crystallization process and they deliver the batch in green, which according to them had the same particle size distribution, same shape, same everything. At the same time, we were also trying to make the API flow better. So we removed the fine, we optimized the aspect ratio, and we produced this batch in, in blue. But let's park it for a while because it's intentionally different. The red and the green, they're supposed to be identical. And to be fair, in a batch process, they were identical because we're doing a co-development of batch and continuous at the time. We did not see any difference between the two batches in a batch process. But in continuous manufacturing, I hope that the video works OK, uh, you can see that the batch in green actually had a better flowability compared to the one in red, even though they were identical, according to colleagues from chemistry. Even more shocking from a scientific point of view was that the batch in blue, which using common knowledge would have been the one flowing better, was actually the worst material we ever processed on the line. It had even worse flowability than some needle-like crystals we put in the gravimetric feeders. And this opened my eyes and made me realize how complex flow behavior really is. Now, I'm not an engineer, so I mean, I can afford saying that I have underestimated certain things. Uh, but definitely, there is much more than size, shape, um, or density in characterizing the flow of your material. There is a lot of properties like nano roughness, rugosity, surface polarity, and you name it, that can have a strong impact on flow of material. So our strategy, and that's the big difference compared to what we've been working in a batch world, we do a lot of more material characterization and understanding of material properties and potential impact on the process dynamics. So together with colleagues from chemistry, we try to build as much as variability as possible at early stages, trying to see what is the impact, for instance, on the feeding performance. Uh, another important aspect of continuous manufacturing is the process understanding. And by this, I mean process dynamics, traceability, transient operation. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint Moha, but uh, the talk today is a bit different than what I gave last time. So I won't be focusing a lot on RTD and process dynamics, but I do have a couple of slides to talk about this. 
So what you see in here is a schematic of a simple direct compression line with the gravimetric feeders, uh, blenders, and the tablet press. Now, your gravimetric feeders, they are the key, the core of a continuous process, and they are a great element of control. Actually, you could control the process just using the feeder parametrics, but they are not perfect. So there is a lot of variation, which is due to, of course, material characteristics, but also uh, refill or vibrations of the line, etc. So what can happen is that you might have a disturbance during the process. And what you see there in green is actually a screenshot of one of our manufacturing run in Presista, where you can have you know, quite a strong disturbance during the, during the process. What does it mean? Well, in theory, you would need to assume that this disturbance will propagate through the line, through your blender, through your private press, and you will find it in the tablet. In reality, we know that this will never happen, because there is always a certain degree of mixing in the line. Of course, mixing in the blenders, but also in the feed frame of the tablet press. So the key question you have to ask yourself is, what is the impact of that disturbance in the final tablets and the quality of the tablets? Because at the end, what really matters is quality of your final draft product. And another important question is, in case you know that there is an impact of that disturbance in the tablets, how can I make sure to deviate surgically only the portion of the run which is affected by the disturbance, so that I don't have to stop the line and throw away everything. Otherwise, continuous manufacturing doesn't become that interesting compared to batch anymore, if I have to every time throw everything, right? And a key aspect in this uh, is given by resident time distribution. It's one of the key elements of controls that we've been using for Presista, Tremoset, but also for all the new uh, products as sort of a platform for our control strategies, also in combination potentially with PAT. I won't go through, well, in a simplistic way, uh, RTD, uh, even though it's been already um, explained brilliantly by Kernan uh, before, is a probability distribution function. So basically, it the, describes the amount of time that the material spends into a unit operation or your entire line. I won't go through much into details and technical aspects, again, because uh, Kernan uh, explained very, very nicely how do we do things and how do we do um, uh, CSTR or PFR modeling to do uh, RTD. But what we do basically, very high level, we determine RTD in the different unit operations, so your feeders, for instance, your blenders, your tablet press, and then by uh, convolution and, of course, confirming the data, we have a full real-time um, uh, RTD. And this is a very powerful tool because it can be used for a variety of things, to set alarms in your feeders, uh, to understand process dynamics, and one of the nicest and you know, more kind of fascinating application is real-time diversion of non-conforming material. So basically, your RTD model can translate the feeder data into concentration of API in the tablets. What does it mean? So if you do have a deviation during your feeder performance, so of a certain intensity of duration, your RTD model translates that disturbance into concentration of API in the tablets. And in case you are out of spec, and out of spec can be your USB nano 5 uh, value, then the system can trigger automatically a diversion of those tablets. And as soon as, based on your RTD model, the disturbance is kind of smeared out, then the tablets are being collected again. Now, again, I don't want to bother you with the technicalities, but the way we do RTD is a mix of experimental modeling and analytical, right? And there is always a certain error associated to each of the steps. And we take into account this propagation of errors, and we subtract it from the uh, out-of-spec limit. So basically, we have a lower limit for rejection, and in a simplistic way, we start the diversion earlier, we end it later, to make sure that we have up to a Six Sigma level of confidence that the tablets we are collecting are good tablets. Why I'm saying all of this is because I always get upset when people believe and they say that continuous manufacturing is only a strategy to cut down costs or to reduce manufacturing in second time. It's actually even more to increase quality of your product. And it's not that we deliver bad quality with batch process, but with continuous manufacturing, we can even increase quality of the medicines we deliver to our patients. Um, a few other things and uh, continues I'd like to go through. And again, uh, Moheb talked about it yesterday. So uh, batch definition, bioequivalent, uh, interaction with regulatory agencies. Um, but I will share my experience, our experience from an industrial perspective. 
Starting from batch definition, uh, again, Mohab described it brilliantly. Uh, the definition that you know from batch world can be applied to continuous manufacturing. The difference between batch and continuous is that in batch, if you want to produce more material, you need a bigger equipment size. In continuous manufacturing, you simply have to run the equipment for longer. But the batch size can be defined as a function of your runtime and throughput rate. And this is, for instance, what we do for Presista. So for Presista, we run at 40 kgs an hour. We have validated up to 32 hours. So the batch size is defined as a function of these two parameters. Or can be defined as a uh, volume of material being produced, or again, as a feed amount that uh, the raw material that you feed into the system. And this is what we do, for instance, for Tramaset, where we worked, as yesterday uh, Lawrence mentioned, with a pre blend of material onto uh, our tin screw granulator. But again, I want to uh, confirm what Moheb said yesterday. Even though the batch size definition is flexible, you have to define a priori your batch size definition as a link to the control strategy. Other thing by equivalence, when I go to conferences, there is always someone who asks, uh, so what is the chance that I'm asked to do a by equivalence study in case I switch my product from batch to continuous manufacturing. This is my opinion, doesn't necessarily reflect that of Janssen, but I don't see any difference whatsoever between batch and continuous manufacturing. If you do have a class two or class four BCS compounds and you do change the composition or the process considerably, you might be asked or there is a high chance that you will be asked to run it by equivalent study. Our experience with Presista is a bit different. Um, Darunavir, the active ingredient of Presista, is a class two BCS. We did change the formulation slightly. We removed one of the excipients. And as a process, well, it's direct compression, but we, of course, replaced manual feeding and diffusive blending with gravimetric feeding and convective blending. But we managed to get a bio waiver. But again, as Moab said yesterday, it's all the ammunition and the strong rationale you have to convince regulatory agencies that your strategy is solid enough. But that doesn't mean that you always get a bio waiver or you always be asked to do a bio study. It's really case by case. But our strategy in general for new products is to implement continuous manufacturing and lock the formulation prior to any pivotal clinical study in order to avoid to being asked by equivalents afterwards. Um, other key aspects of continuous is real-time release testing, which as defined by the ICHQ-8 is the um, way to ensure uh, quality of the final drug product based on in-process data. And what better process if not continuous manufacturing to enable real-time release testing? But I think there is no doubt that continuous manufacturing offers you a great opportunity to do RTRT. The question that several people have is, does it make sense or is it an overkill? Once again, we can only speak by experience and data. One of my favorite quotations is always, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And what you see in here is what it meant for us applying RTRT for Presista. So when we launched uh, Presista in batch process in 2008, of course, everything went through the QC lab. And to do the testing or to release the batch, it took more than 21 days. When we launched uh, Presista as a batch process in 2016, uh, ID, content uniform, and NSA were done as a RTRT using PAT data. But purity and dissolution were done in the lab. But we already cut from 21 days to eight days. This year, FDA approved our surrogate model to predict dissolution of the Runavir based on inline data. And we got sunset for purity. And as you can see, we went from 21 to 8 to less than one day to release the batch. And this is pretty impressive. Um, so is there an advantage of real-time release testing? I would say yes. Uh, is it easy? No. And definitely for new products we have in the pipeline, which are more complex than Presista, to develop surrogate models will be even more complicated. But we are strongly believer that RTRT is one of the key elements of continuous manufacturing. So as early as in development, we start collecting data to support the development of RTRT by the time we get in commercial. Another key aspect, uh, interaction with regulatory agencies, and it was described, again, I talked about it yesterday. Um, what you see in the slide here is all the approvals we have for Presista globally. Actually, there is Algeria missing. Now, coming back to one of the comments from someone yesterday, said, yeah, um, I know about FDA, EMA, but what about the other regulatory agencies? Well, you don't see only FDA and EMA here. You see Ukraine, you see Taiwan, you see Brazil. 
So definitely, I mean, we can say that it's, it's possible. We have proven that it's possible. And our experience dealing with regulatory agencies, it's been extremely positive. It's true that FDA is a much stronger technical understanding of continuous manufacturing than others, but all the regulatory agencies we have interacted with, they do realize the advantage of continuous manufacturing for patients, and they've been extremely supportive of implementing this uh, technology. Again, I wanted to confirm what Moheb said yesterday, reach out proactively to uh, the health authorities. Don't go there with open questions, but go there with a strategy. But there is definitely a willing to, to help you out from all of them. And I mean, the situation has been reflected to what we see uh, today in the market. So again, I don't want to repeat what has been said yesterday, but we have five approvals from the FDA, the same in Europe. Uh, we have recently a new approval from P PMDA, from our Tramacet. We have more than 30 accepted requests in the emergency technology program, um, and we have a lot of uh, new chemical entities being developed using continuous manufacturing. So we might see in the next five to 10 years an exponential increase of product files using this technology. Um, I still have a few minutes left, so I wanted to go through um, also how Continuous manufacturing is impacting research and development, right? Because we've been talking a lot about uh, conversion of legacy products, but the strategy is ready definitely to work on new chemical entities. Now, the biggest impact that continuous manufacturing is having on R&D is the implementation of a final size equipment much earlier in development. So we don't work with you know, progressive size equipment, but we implement kind of the final equipment much earlier. Sometimes we even use continuous to make phase one clinical batches or phase two. Now, of course, this has a strong advantage when it comes to de-risking, you know, things that might go wrong later on. But one of the disadvantage, uh, or oh, partial disadvantage, is API consumption at early stages, which is a bit higher than what we do need in batch. Overall, continuous manufacturing is still bits batch uh, in terms of API saving, especially if you look at the tech transfer phase, if you're transferring to a similar equipment, we might save several hundred kgs of material compared to batch. And you know, at this stage, API still is quite costly, so it's, it's a major saving that we do. But we cannot neglect the fact that at early stages of development, uh, we might need more material, also because we have our RTD model, PAT models, et cetera, to develop. And we cannot neglect the fact that at this stage, API is very costly, is very scarce, and the therapeutic areas, most of the time, they are not willing to front load and invest the production of a huge amount of API when the chances of this program even to get through are very thin. So we want to make this stage even more interesting than what it is today, right? And we've been working with, comp uh, with universities like Rutgers and uh, Ghent University in Europe to develop strategies to accelerate development, but also to save uh, materials. And uh, one of the greatest collaboration we have been having is the this creation of material property database, a real library of material exceptions and APIs, not only internal but also external, that in combination with multivariate data analysis can offer a really holistic and powerful tool to backtrack the effect of material on the line to find surrogate materials that we can use as a replacement for our API to the development, or even data predictive models to basically link the material properties to the unit operations. One example of application is the uh, working with surrogate materials. So our aspiration in the next uh, few years is to being able to identify a surrogate material, meaning a material which is inexpensive, non-toxic, and available on the market off the shelf within Janssen, that we can use as a replacement for our API. So it has similar characteristics to the API. So we can do development with this material and then confirm uh, with our API, right? So what we do basically is once we have a new material, we characterize a certain data package, we project into PCA, and we looked in the space how this material fits with the other materials we have in the library. And then, you know, based on this, we can basically, as I mentioned earlier, run development with the, with the surrogate and uh, then confirm with the final API. 
Um, another application then is the creation of these data-driven models. Again, starting from material property database, we have been creating models for the different unit operations. For instance, for the feeders, when it comes to feed factor, uh, resident time distribution, uh, etc., and even for the blenders, the tablet press, and the different unit ops. So basically, what we can do is predict in silico, for instance, the, what kind of screw configuration we want to use for the new product, even without running the experiments. What we can do then here, again, starting with the new material, we characterize the material, we project into a PLS model, uh, we can select the screw configuration based on the predicted um, uh, fit factor. Then we run a confirmatory trial with our API, and we update the model knowledge based on the new data. So uh, we are working on it, and this is really definitely changing uh, the, the way we do development uh, using continuous manufacturing. We are today at a stage where we are implementing models for single unit operation, and then next, hopefully within five years, we'll be able to do a flushing modeling, so really a digital twin of our line, copy, digital copy of our hardware line, where we can run in silico experiments and predict sort of the impact of material properties or process parameters on the final quality attributes. We're also working on interchangeability models. I mean, we see more and more equipment vendors going into continuous manufacturing, and we cannot exclude the possibility of, of transferring the product from a line to a different line. And this might be a challenge, of course. So we want to reduce the development effort in transferring from line to different line. And also, we're trying to reduce the development effort in case we want to uh, increase or reduce the throughputs later on in commercial. And again, at the same time, we're working a lot with in vitro and vivo models, not only in support of RTRT, but in general as our biofarm overall strategy. So, Sorry, I gave you a lot of information today, but the key message is that continuous manufacturing is much more than an equipment. There is a strong synergism between different disciplines, between formulation, material characterization, modeling, regulatory, quality, uh, you name it. It is a big investment, uh, not really in terms of equipment, but more in terms of competences you have to build in the company. So you have to bring in, attract talents, you have to develop people you have internally. But this investment will definitely pay off in terms of financial, operational advantages, and first and foremost, quality. With that, it's, uh, that's all. I will try and answer the questions in case I'm not able. I will note them down and uh, report them back to our experts. Thank you very much, uh, Jussie, an excellent presentation. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Uh, I noticed in your presentation that uh, from the regulatory perspective, uh, you got approval for the change in process from batch to continuous, and then later on, you got another approval for real-time release testing. Yes. Okay. So why did you do that? Is it to minimize the risk? Uh, at the second stage, you mean? Right. Why did you do it in two steps rather than in a single step? Uh, well, the full story is that we actually did submit um, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, our surrogate model to predict the solution for persist. And it was rejected because we wanted to, or oh, FDA asked us to come back and create more data, generate more data. Uh, so it's been a two-tier approach, mainly because of this aspect. Uh, but also wasn't the intention in the beginning to file RTRT together with the process. It's never been the scope, but it's something we wanted to do at some, at some point. Okay, so if you do it again, are you going to use the same approach or are you going to uh, do it in one shot? Not necessarily. We're trying to do it in one shot. Okay. Um, again, not always probably it makes sense, so it's uh, always you know, a it business depends. case evaluation. It depends, but uh, if we do it again, then most likely we'll do it in one shot. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes. Yeah. So, good morning. It's a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have one question. When we are changing the interchangeability model, okay, what are all the due diligence uh, one has to do that and uh, what is the regulatory guidance for the same? Uh, for the interchangeability models, uh, where well, we are at the very early stage of it. We just realized that there is a need uh, for interchangeability models because we might need to transfer to different lines. And what we see in batch when transferring to different equipment, things might go wrong, right? And or there is a certain redevelopment effort that you have to put into it. And I just think that 
one of the key advantages of continuous manufacturing is transferring to a similar line and having to avoid doing this redevelopment, right? So thanks to these models, we hope that we can cut down these development activities and uh, sort of, you know, predict in silico most of the uh, in potential impact of uh, process parameter changes. But we're not quite there yet. So we just started a, an academic collaboration. They will run over the next three or four years at least. So we, we don't have a lot of uh, things to talk about at this stage. We have an idea on how to do it, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. One more question. Uh, if I can carry on with your first question, just for clarification. So if you prove that in silico modeling uh, uh, changeability, you're still going to go and do verification? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, we are continuing the question to uh, Sar also. Um, uh, when, uh, I mean, we are continuously uh, uh, monitoring the SUBA guidelines, okay? So, uh, but uh, there is no update for the continuous manufacturing in the recent update, whatever they have uh, released last year. So, uh, in your pre-NDA or uh, uh, in, when, when your NCE or NDA got uh, uh, on the, during the gold date, you might have got some queries or responses, right? So, um, uh, what kind of guidance or what kind of uh, uh, guidance you got it from FDA? with respect to, you know, uh, when you are changing it from batch from manufacturing batch. to continuous manufacturing again for the process to... Uh, that, that's an answer that probably require one day. Uh, so it's something probably I think we can, we can discuss offline um, because it's been, you know, years and years of experience and um, it was one of the first products. So, of course, there was a lot of questions around, for instance, use of RTD models, right, in... Uh, guaranteeing uh, the process robustness. So it was a new thing in the industry. Uh, so there were a lot of questions, especially from regulators around it. Um, but, um, but yeah, there, there were a lot of things of feedback from, from the FDA, which would take probably too long to discuss. Yeah, if, I, if I can add to that, uh, I just want to make, make sure you and the other colleagues in the room understand there is no one size fits all. So it is the responsibility of the manufacturer based on the nature of the API, the nature of the equipment, the nature of the process, the way they are going to run it, et cetera, et cetera, to develop a strategy of how they plan to implement continuous. And then once you do that, and after you do that, then you go to the agency. Don't expect, even after ICHQ 13 is finalized, that there will be a template that guide you in a stepwise approach no. to do that. I'm sure you understand that. Uh, but I think you will have to do it uh, yourself based on uh, your uh, implementation approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions? You are so quiet today. A Too question, much I food and wine last night? There's a question in the back. Question in the back. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you have a mic? I'll give you one. Um, first of all, congratulations on the, on the submission and the approval. Uh, so my question was, uh, when this has gone into routine production, have you had to deal with any rejections and recalls and putting your models into application? And then following on from that, if you have, what has been your quality organization's comfort with adopting your model and, and quarantine, quarantining a set amount of material? Right. Um, to my knowledge, we n we've never been in that situation, so the process has always been run quite smoothly. Um, but I'm not the best person to answer that question, so I will definitely note it down and get back to um, some people in the organization so we can exchange probably business cards, and uh, I'll get back to your, to your question. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Justino, for an okay. outstanding presentation.